So it probably comes as no surprise to all of you that I have a huge sweet tooth. In fact, this flower communion ritual was born out of a typo when I was creating a message for our F-L-O-W-E-R flower communion ritual last year. So I said, all right, why not roll with it? <laughs> you know, I did not intend for that. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes the universe provides puns and they're wonderful. <laughs> so you may have seen some of my photos or heard some of the stories of the absurd and wonderful baking innovations um, that my sweet tooth has led to. Some of you have even nourished my sweet tooth by gifting me with cookies, date bars, and huge bars of chocolate. Continued donations are always welcome. <laughs> And some of you have even baked with me as part of my budding anti-Islamophobia ministry called Sugaria Law. <laughs> so this is probably my favorite outcome of my decision to go to seminary. And it happened totally by accident. I was, as I am often still prone to do, including this morning, procrastinating on a paper for one of my Islamic studies classes. And then I made a joke about the Oreo stuffed chocolate chip cookies I was making. It's shirk. Now, without getting too theological in this sermon, uh, shirk is a concept within the Islamic traditions that's often described as the problematic association of partners with God. So two cookies in one, two sugary partners, became that association of partners with God. They became shirk stuffed cookies. <laughs> well, naturally, my pun-loving self, which is apparently in full gear right now, kicked in. I started brainstorming other alliterative desserts. Jihad jam sandwich cookies. <laughs> Hijab hot fudge sundaes. And fatwa fudge. <laughs> there is a long list of these. So before I knew it, a baking ministry was born. Sugaria Law, in which all of the treats functioned as metaphors for concepts within the Islamic traditions and could be used as learning tools and conversation starters. And I learned an important lesson about procrastination that day. It has sweet rewards for my ministry. <laughs> so the procrastination of that day did lead me down this wonderful exploration of all the gifts that baking has to offer us in life, and not just its edible educational puns. The process of baking itself has much to teach us about what it means to be human. As Lou mentioned earlier in their call to worship, this past Monday marked the Celtic holiday of Lamas, on which bread is baked and shared in community as an act of gratitude for all the good in our lives. It's a time when observants are invited to remember that we are shaped, we shape and we are shaped by our lives, and we are both the baker and the bread. Through the process of baking and sharing bread together, observants are, are able to honor the ways in which they are nourished, and in turn, they can nourish others. So of course, my metaphor-loving self can't stop the comparison there. There's so much about baking that captures the power of what it means to be in community, what it means to strive for beloved community. Though he didn't create it, Martin Luther King Jr. is often credited for bringing the term to the center of many conversations around social justice and transformation. He envisioned the beloved community as a society in which all people recognize and engage with love, that reality that, quote, all life is interrelated, that we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. That I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you are to, ought to be 
until I am what I ought to be. Beloved community, as King describes, is a term many you use are familiar with, and one that I know several of you have held at the front of your minds and hearts in your justice work, in your witness work, and your support of one another. And a quick glance at the seven principles on the back of your order of service, a quick glance at our mission as a congregation, it's a clear reminder that much of how we strive to be as Unitarian Universalists resonates with Dr. King's vision. And part of that vision, I believe, is the realization that beloved community is more of a process than a destination. It is a way of being in the world, one that requires energy and effort. Beloved community is rooted in a constant commitment to our relationships and that sense of interdependence. It is rooted in the responsibility that we have towards each other. It is perseverant in its recognition of the siblinghood of all humanity, the kinship of all life. Beloved community is not a finishing place, but an act of creating with a love that is constantly aware, constantly engaged, and constantly adapting. A love that does not shy away from conflict, but engages it with justice, equity, and compassion. The process of beloved community is one in which we exercise, cultivate, and stretch our capacity to relate to one another and our world. It is a process through which we practice and learn those skills of creativity, flexibility, forgiveness, resilience, hope, reverence, curiosity, and yes, humility. The process of beloved community is when we deepen and strengthen the bonds of grace, of gratitude, and of love. And as our communities evolve, so do the ways in which we exercise and develop those skills. As people leave and enter our communities, like our new staff coming in in just a couple of weeks, as our individual lives shift, as the world of which we are a part changes, so does what it looks like to be in beloved community. And so, the metaphor. Beloved community is a process that I believe resembles baking. In baking and beloved community, we bring together multiple ingredients, different ingredients, each with their own characteristics, their own gifts, their own pasts, and combine them to make something new, something that none of them could do on their own. And in bringing these different ingredients together, whether in the process of beloved community or baking, we not only witness, but we intentionally generate and experience certain reactions. Fizzing, melting, congealing, curdling, rising, bonding, and so forth. In baking, energy is required to mix, to knead, and to stretch. And in beloved community, we put a lot of energy into doing much of the same with our spirits and society. In baking, reflection and intention is required to carefully measure and sift the ingredients. In beloved community, the same is required as we explore how we want to be and create this world together. In baking, there are recipes to follow, but sometimes there are times when we can adjust, substitute, or experiment with something we know is more impactful or inclusive for our community. Even if it means making a little bit more effort to get that egg substitute or look for that white flour, rice flour, excuse me. In beloved community, we have ways of coming together that have worked in the past, but as we strive for greater inclusivity and welcome, we find new tools and methods that nourish a more diverse gathering, the creation of our ascent-free zone. 
And just as movement and mixing is part of the baking process, so is allowing the ingredients to rest and to chill. Letting our bodies rest as other dimensions of the process beyond our letting our bodies rest as other dimensions of the process beyond our control do the work we cannot is part of beloved community. In beloved community, moving aside and resting not only makes for a more sustainable process that we can continue, it also makes for a more inclusive one. Now, as we rest in the baking process, it can be a delicious treat to eat some of that raw cookie dough or to lick that spoon covered in batter. But it's important to be cautious of just how much we enjoy that moment, lest we make ourselves sick by eating a little too much raw egg. In beloved community, it's important to celebrate each new movement, each shift and progression towards greater inclusivity, and it's also important to keep ourselves from getting stuck in that place where we are no longer able to see what more is possible. Now, for anyone who has experimented with baking, we also know that things can go quite wrong. Sometimes our treats end up a little too burnt, a little too hard and crunchy that no amount of dipping into milk or tea can save. Sometimes the dough doesn't rise, Sometimes it doesn't hold together. And the same goes for beloved community. Sometimes it is really hard. Sometimes it is really uncomfortable. Sometimes the conflict gets a little too crunchy, and sometimes the changes feel a little too slow to rise. Sometimes we will make mistakes as we learn and create the process of being together, together. And perhaps that's the best part about both baking and beloved community. The part that reminds me of the gift of grace and the importance of celebrating our imperfections. Both baking and beloved community are incredibly messy processes. Both mean getting your hands dirty being willing to get into the sticky, the mushy, the sweet, the sour, the flour and crevices you didn't know you had, mess of creating. Both baking and beloved community mean being okay with the fact that sometimes you're gonna get some egg on your face. Well, here at MDUUC, we are the bakers and the bread of beloved community. We are the creators and the creation of that dynamic process of mixing ingredients, familiar and new. As people enter and exit our community, we are updating our recipe every day. We are seeing what tools and furniture we can add, replace, or use in new ways. In this moment, especially as those transitions and staffing in our physical structures occur, we are in that dynamic process of creating and being created. And as we continue to look at what it means to be a sanctuary congregation, as we explore how to address aspects of our nation's white supremacy culture in our midst, as we recognize the impact of the Bay Area's housing crisis among our own members, we engage in that process of beloved community, mixing, kneading, stretching, and rising in love. And we don't do it alone. Just as baking is more fun and less demanding when done with the help of others, beloved community is more effective and sustainable when we commit to cultivating it together. Because the truth is just as transformative and necessary as the process of beloved community is, it is hard work. In a society that emphasizes individualism, it is actually countercultural work to recognize that we are interdependent, that our well being is bound up with one another's. It is countercultural work to be honest and open to change, to be vulnerable about our limitations and our growing edges, to accept and to offer help, to be stretched to be needed, 
to stay in that heat of transformation. It is counterculture work to let others change you and to invest yourself into helping others to grow. It is hard work. It is ever-evolving work. And I believe it is life-giving work. Beloved community is nourishing work. As we come together to mix and create, we also come together to feed each other with the knowledge that we know we are not alone. We feed each other with the hope that there are more and more and more of us engaged in this process of expanding love, more of us committed to creating an inclusive and expansive dough. As we go beyond the security of this hour that we spend together, we go forth knowing that we have each other. We go forth knowing that we are a part of something larger than our own individual selves, we go forth celebrating that we are connected to everyone and everything and the possibility that those connections hold. So today, in this moment, with our ingredients, with our tools, with our recipes, with our flexibility, what kind of bread do you want to make now? Do we want to make now? What kind of dough do we want to create? What kind of world do we want to build together? You all have done wonderfully in bringing forth some flower communion treats. And now I invite us as a community, in whatever messy way seems appropriate to you, just not as messy that you get crumbs on the floor, there are napkins, so let's give Tristan an easier time with cleanup after this, to come forth and take of the gifts that members of your community have brought to nourish and sustain you. To come forth and share in breaking bread, knowing that each time we gather, we sustain one another's souls. And knowing that by taking that piece you carry with you this community and the love that it creates. And as you do so, Laura will be playing another one of her wonderful songs. And I invite you to also keep in mind if we have individuals with mobility needs, to offer them support as they need for accessing the food. So please come forward in the spirit of beloved community, grab a bite to eat, and we'll end our worship in just a little bit. <laughs> remember, remember the nourishment you have received here. Remember the nourishment that you are called to give. As we leave this sanctuary space, let us go forward and create a sanctuary of our own together, kneading, stretching, and bringing that heat of transformation. Go in peace and in love and take some goods with you.